going on besties in this video we're going to be talking about hypertension specifically when it comes to diagnostic breakdown and pathophysiology let's get started so what exactly is hypertension so hypertension is commonly referred to as high blood pressure and it's a chronic medical condition where the blood pressure in the arteries is persistently elevated so when we're trying to determine the severity of hypertension we look at two types systolic and diastolic. So let's break it down. The American Heart Association defines normal blood pressure as having a systolic reading, that's the pressure during the heartbeat, of under 120 millimeters of mercury, and a normal diastolic pressure, that's the pressure between beats, is less than 80 millimeters of mercury. So remember, both of these, that's why we have the words and and or as we move down this chart, both of these have to be met because we have the word and in order for it to be considered normal. But what about when your blood pressure starts to inch up a little bit, but isn't quite high yet? That's what we call elevated and pre-hypertension. So that's when your systolic pressure ranges between 120 to 129, while the diastolic pressure remains under 80. So again, both of these have to be met in order for it to be elevated or pre-hypertension. Now let's talk about stage one hypertension. This is when things get a little bit more serious. So you're looking at systolic pressures that would be between 130 and 139, or you have a diastolic pressure that ranges between 80 and 89 millimeters of mercury. So here's where you can experience either a mix of both systolic and diastolic hypertension, or they could just be isolated. So that's where we're seeing this word or in our chart here. If we escalate to stage two hypertension, this is where that concern starts to grow. The stage is more defined, right? We're seeing a systolic pressure of 140 or higher, or we're looking at a diastolic pressure that's 90 or higher. This is really when we start to become very concerned. Now, if we have somebody experience hypertensive crisis, this is really, really bad, especially in our patients, they become more vulnerable, right? They're, the risk of damage to their body rapidly increases as we're starting to see blood pressures around here. So we can see a systolic blood pressure higher than 180 and or we can see a diastolic blood pressure greater than 120. So when we start to see these types of blood pressures, we really, our main goal as healthcare professionals is to address immediately the blood pressure to get it to come down because we're going to start to see organ damage that's going to start to occur very rapidly if we sustain at these high blood pressures. Let's take a look about why blood pressure is important. So the significance of maintaining high blood pressure is clear and well established through various studies. Elevated blood pressure is a known risk factor for several serious types of health conditions. This can include stroke, ischemic cardiomyopathy, as well as coronary artery disease, just to name a few of them. All of them are linked to severe health outcomes. Therefore, reducing blood pressure can significantly lower the risk of these conditions. And researchers have demonstrated that even a modest reduction in blood pressure, just by say five millimeters of mercury, can lead to substantial health benefits. So diagnosing hypertension seems pretty straightforward, right? We wrap an inflatable cuff around the patient's arm, we inflate it to constrict the blood flow, then we slowly release air in, from the cuff to to listen with our stethoscope to get those systolic and diastolic blood pressure numbers, right? Simple, but maybe not. There is a twist. Some individuals experience something as what we call white coat hypertension. So this phenomenon occurs when a patient's blood pressure reads high in the clinical setting, but is typically normal when they're outside of the doctor's office. So typically the person could have a blood pressure of 120 over 80 or even lower when they're outside of the clinic. However, they have high blood pressure when they come in the clinic and it's often attributed to patients being anxious or they're stressed out about being in the medical environment. I personally experienced that. So when do we accurately diagnose hypertension as being hypertension? So the standard procedure really when it comes to taking blood pressures is to take two separate blood pressure readings during two different office visits. So if the reading is consistently showing greater than 140 over 90, we're gonna categorize it as stage two hypertension. If it's showing greater than 130 over 80, but it's below 140 over 90, then we can diagnose 
side of stage one hypertension. Treatment decisions for stage one can depend on the individual's cardiovascular risk factors as well as additional things that the doctor will look into. But what if somebody's blood pressure is always high when they're in the office? How do we differentiate between true hypertension and that white coat hypertension that we talked about? Well, there is something called an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring when it comes to monitoring these patients at home. So this test involves a 24 hour blood pressure monitoring system at the patient's house, where it's gonna provide an average of blood pressure readings throughout the entire day, including separate averages for morning as well as night. So these readings really give us a clear picture of what the individual's true blood pressure status is, helping us distinguish between actual hypertension and white coat hypertension. So hypertension can come in different causes as well as being categorized by different things. So we have primary, also known as essential hypertension, and we have secondary hypertension. So we're gonna start with primary or essential hypertension. And the exact cause of this hypertension is not really clear. So we call that idiopathic in medicine. This is the most common type of hypertension that can be seen upwards of 90% of cases when we're looking at these patients. These cases typically occur in individuals who are between 20 and 50 55 years of age, if we're looking at someone outside of that range, we're most likely thinking that it's something else. Among the potential factors influencing primary hypertension is an overly active sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system plays a crucial role when it comes to regulating blood vessel tone. So it originates up in that thoracic columnar region and the sympathetic neurons target arterioles and can trigger vasoconstriction by releasing norepinephrine onto receptors of the smooth muscle of blood vessels. So this heightened sympathetic nervous system activity can lead to increased peripheral resistance, meaning that there isn't really going to have a whole lot of open space for the blood to flow freely. Our blood vessels are going to constrict. So with that increased resistance and that constriction of our blood vessels, it is going to cause the patient's blood pressure to become elevated. Another way to hypertension involves our kidneys, specifically those juxtoglomerial apparatus. So those juxtoglomerial cells, which respond to this norepinephrine, releases a hormone called renin. So renin plays a crucial role in the body's regulatory mechanisms when it comes to the production of angiotensin II. So angiotensin II, in turn, affects blood pressure through various means. It increases the production of aldosterone, that hormone that causes the kidneys to absorb more uh, sodium and water into the bloodstream. That's gonna ultimately elevate the blood pressure. And they also stimulate antidiuretic hormone, also known as ADH. And with ADH, it's gonna aid the kidneys in water reabsorption, reducing the amount of water excreted in urine. It's also going to cause vasoconstrictin, all of which is going to collectively cause an increase in our blood pressure. Occasionally, certain people are going to exhibit an unusually active renin angiotensin aldosterone system. This means that the kidneys release renin in abnormally large quantities. An excess of renin production, like we just talked about, is going to lead to that surge in angiotensin II, which is subsequently going to uh, stimulate that aldosterone, ADH, and increase our blood pressure. So it's really important when we're looking at our patients to see what's going on with their kidneys. Are we seeing an excess of that renin production due to an active renin angiotensin aldosterone system? In addition to our brain and our kidneys, our sympathetic nervous system is also going to influence our heart particularly our SA node. So the activation of that SA node by the sympathetic nervous system is going to lead in an increase of heart rate, right? That sinoatrial node that sits up there in the corner of our heart is going to get stimulated, so it's going to beat the heart much faster. It's going to cause an increase in that heart rate. That higher heart rate is going to result in an increase in the cardiac output. We're going to be pushing a lot more blood out, which is in turn going to elevate our patient's blood pressure. Additionally, the sympathetic nervous system system acts on the ventricular myocardium. That's the heart's contractile cells, enhancing that contractility or that force of contraction, right? We're going to have a lot more force. If we have more force, that means we're going to see an increase in our stroke volume as well as our cardiac output, thus leading us to an increase in blood pressure. So another common form of hypertension, particularly when it comes to the elderly and the African-American individuals, is known as low renin hypertension. So in these patients, the kidneys reduce sodium excretion. 
So less sodium in the urine implies that there's gonna be more sodium retained in the bloodstream. This is gonna to lead to an increase in sodium retention. This increase in that sodium is going to cause a corresponding rise in blood volume. As we know, water follows salt, right? So it's gonna elevate our blood pressure. But there's an intriguing aspect to this process. As blood pressure rises due to that increase in blood volume, it's going to impact those juxtoglomerial cells that we have in the kidneys. Under normal circumstances, high blood pressure would suppress that release of renin, since renin's role is to increase blood pressure through angiotensin II and aldosterone. However, in low renin hypertension, this feedback mechanism leads to a reduced renin production. So consequently, there's gonna be a decrease in that angiotensin II production, which paradoxically does not contribute to high blood pressure in these cases. This kind of unique scenario is where hypertension is gonna be associated with sodium retention in the bloodstream, which is gonna increase the blood volume and it's gonna reduce renin activity. This is why it's termed low renin hypertension. Here's another intriguing aspect. The precise cellular mechanism is not generally understood, but it's known that sodium can induce vasoconstriction. That is that tightening of our blood pressures. So the increase in sodium concentration is going to initiate this constriction of our blood vessels. What does that mean for blood pressure? Well, ultimately it's gonna to lead to an increase in that total peripheral resistance that we talked about earlier. And with that resistance, it's also like gonna cause our overall blood pressure to become increased. So this relationship between sodium retention vasoconstriction and increased peripheral vascular resistance is a key factor when it comes to understanding blood pressure dynamics. So what are some risk factors that we need to take into account when we're considering looking at primary hypertension? There's two categories. We have modifiable and non-modifiable. So for our non-modifiable, these are things that we cannot change, right? Genetics, a family history of hypertension is gonna ultimately increase the patient of having a genetic predisposition to having it. That's not something that we're gonna be able to change. Age, right? A person's age, typically as we get older, the blood vessels are gonna naturally lose some of that elasticity that we had when we were younger, which is ultimately going to lead to an increase in resistance as well as high blood pressures. Next we have gender, right? So generally men are more likely to develop hypertension at a younger age than women. However, when it comes to women after menopause, that risk of developing hypertension increases, most likely due to the hormonal changes that we experience. Next, we have race and ethnicity. Certain ethnic groups, particularly African-Americans, are gonna have a higher incidence when it comes to hypertension. This is likely due to genetic factors, environmental influences, as well as other vascular sensitivity when it particularly comes to salt, that sodium. And next we have modifiable. So these are the things that we can change. We can implement changes in order to lower our blood pressure. So we start with high salt sodium intake. So remember, excessive salts in our diets is going to cause the body to retain more fluid. Remember, fluid is going to follow salt. So in order to maintain that concentration of electrolytes, what the body is going to do is it's gonna increase that fluid retention, which is going to result in a high blood pressure. So with those higher volumes, it's gonna put an additional strain on our heart, our blood vessels, leading to an elevated blood pressure. So really when we're looking at salt intake, that's why we have see like a lot of DASH diets where we're limiting salt. We really wanna make sure that our patients are very aware that salt needs to be eliminated as much as possible, especially in those individuals who are more salt sensitive. Next we have obesity, right? So excessive fat is gonna increase the workload on our heart, making our heart have to pump stronger. And obesity is often one of the leading causes when it comes to insulin resistance, which can increase blood pressure by impairing the body's ability to use insulin effectively, leading to those higher circulating blood glucose volumes as well as insulin levels. And when it comes to obesity, one of the other things that's really important to know is that inflammation can actually occur specifically just with obesity and increase the stiffness of our blood vessels contributing to those hypertensions as well. Physical inactivity. So inactivity leads to weight gain, decreased cardiovascular efficiency, and this can also weaken the heart muscle and the blood vessels, making them less efficient when it comes to pumping blood and circulating blood volume. Alcohol consumption, very important. 
that we eliminate that or at least limit it as much as possible because alcohol can directly and indirectly affect blood pressure by stimulating our sympathetic nervous system. We talked about that before. If we stimulate it, it's going to stimulate our SANO, which is going to increase our heart rate, which is ultimately going to constrict our blood vessels. And then smoking. Smoking and tobacco use, big, big no-nos. Nicotine and tobacco use stimulates the nervous system as well, causing that temporary increase in blood pressure as well as our heart rate. When it comes to long-term smoking is that it can ultimately damage our blood vessel walls, promoting that arterial sclerosis, that narrowing of our blood pressure due to plaque. Stress. Very hard, especially working in healthcare, to eliminate stress, but you know, chronic stress over time is going to trigger the body's fight or flight response, releasing those hormones like cortisol and adrenaline, which are going to increase heart rate as well as constrict our blood vessels, causing our blood pressure to go up. And then lastly, sleep apnea. It's not something that we commonly talk about, but obstructive sleep apnea causes repeated breathing interruptions during the night, right? When we're sleeping or during the day, reducing that oxygen level within the blood and ultimately going to strain our cardiovascular system. So repeated episodes of having that low oxygenation is going to cause those nighttime blood pressures to increase, which can ultimately carry over into daytime hypertension as well. Now let's talk about secondary hypertension. So this is important to note that it is ultimately the less common type of hypertension. It only really accounts for about 10% of hypertension cases. So when we're considering secondary hypertension, particularly in exam and clinical settings, you're often going to be looking at younger individuals, typically under 20 years of age, who have hypertension due to some underlying disease. A major player in the context of disease is usually the kidneys. So the kidneys play a vital role when it comes to blood pressure regulation. When they're damaged, it's also ultimately going to lead to hypertension taking place. So specifically, if we're looking at the parenchymal tissues of the kidneys, we're looking at the internal structures like kidney tubules, crucial for that reabsorption and excretion in compromised systems. Those are what usually really causes the problems. This kind of renal parenchymal disease leads to an increase in that sodium and water retention, ultimately leading to that escalating blood pressure like we talked about before. But what exactly are the renal parenchymal diseases. Well, with these disorders, we're looking at actual renal tissues, not the blood vessels themselves that supply the kidneys. So damage can occur in various parts of the kidneys, including those collecting ducts, the proximal convoluted tubules, the loop of Henle, as well as those glomeruli. It's the injury in these structures that contribute to the development of the hypertension, highlighting the importance that kidney structural integrity is essential in order to maintain normal blood pressure. So what kind of disease processes are we going to be looking at? Damage of the renal tubules can affect blood pressure. For instance, polycystic kidney disease characterized by the formation of multiple cysts in our kidneys can interrupt that reabsorption and excretion processes. And really when we're looking at factors, what factors can lead to the damage of the glomeruli, a crucial part of our kidney as well? Well, one such condition is glomerular nephritis. So there is a group of diseases affecting the glomeruli that the kidney structures are responsible for filtrating plasma. So while there are multiple types of glomerular nephritis, we're not going to delve too much into them here. They are something that will ultimately cause secondary hypertension. Another significant condition linked to kidney damage can also lead to end-stage renal disease is known as diabetic neuropathy. You see this a lot. This disease involves glomerular sclerosis, which means damage to those glomeruli impacting the filtration ability. So diabetes plays a key role in harming glomeruli and can often come in various forms, including glomerular nephritis related to different conditions. So moving on from those renal parenchymal causes, it's also important to consider renal vascular causes, right? Because they involve blood vessels leading to the kidney, which is crucial for the excretion of water and solutes, especially when it comes to sodium. So let's imagine that these blood vessels are compromised, which is usually the case when we're seeing some kind of stenosis or arterial sclerosis within the renal arterial walls. This condition, known as narrowing, limits the blood flow to the kidneys that's going to result in decreased urinary excretion. So think about it. If our kidneys are not getting the blood supply to filter and maintain homeostasis, they will eventually die, causing the body to have to combat this with their own internal defense mechanisms. So consequently, more water, salt, and blood plasma is going to accumulate, ultimately increasing the risk of hypertension. One specific cause of this is renal artery stenosis. This is characterized by plaque buildup 
leading to the narrowing of the artery. Another possible scenario can include vasculitis. So that's an inflammation of the vascular walls. This can ultimately lead to that narrowing and also alter the blood flow that's gonna get through that renal artery. Besides the kidneys, we also have our endocrine system. So with endocrine causes of hypertension, we're looking at our adrenal gland and our adrenal gland sits right on top of our kidneys and perform a lot of various functions. So aldosterone is produced by the outer layer of that adrenal gland. If there's an excessive production of aldosterone, elevated aldosterone levels are going to lead to increased sodium and water reabsorption, which in turn raises blood pressure. Your adrenal gland also releases cortisol. So with increased cortisol levels, we see this a lot with Cushing syndrome. So this can contribute also to that hypertension. Cortisol enhances the sensitivity of norepinephrine and epinephrine receptors. So when these receptors are more sensitive, the binding of that norepinephrine and epinephrine has a more pronounced effect. This is ultimately going to result in an increase in that vasoconstriction. That vasoconstriction driven by those high levels of cortisol are going to lead to elevated blood pressures. So when we're considering these patient conditions and the various factors that are taking place, we really need to be looking at what the underlying diseases are. So we're going to start doing a lot of labs and things to try to rule out what exactly is happening with the hypertension. So you're going to see a lot of individuals are going to be ordering like BUN levels, creatinine levels, even potentially looking at glomerular filtration rates to try to figure out the exact cause so that they can reverse them. In cases of elevated aldosterone levels, electrolyte imbalances are going to to be expected. So typically you're going to see high sodium levels and low potassium levels. Remember, the body tries to balance this imbalance by pulling what it needs out of the cells and pushing what it doesn't need into the cells in order to eliminate it when we have other functions that would typically do that not working appropriately. So you're going to see where the cells are gonna be pushing out potassium, right? That is an intracellular electrolyte. You're gonna see a lot more potassium is gonna be pushed out of the cells and it's gonna to try to pull in all of that sodium in order to get rid of it. So you're gonna see those low potassium levels and those high sodium levels um, when we have somebody with elevated aldosterone levels within their body. For patients, when we're looking at them with Cushing syndrome, so there's gonna be a distinct physical and metabolic changes that you're gonna see with these patients. They're gonna have a more uh, pendular obesity they're going to have this characteristic kind of buffalo hump behind their head, their face. They're going to have this like moon face appearance. It's going to be really big and puffy. They're going to be hyperglycemic. They're going to have abdominal striae, which is just a fancy way of saying stretch marks. Each of these symptoms are going to provide important clues in order for us to identify the underlying condition, particularly when it comes to the context of disease processes with the kidneys, as well as hormonal imbalances. So in addition to our kidneys and our adrenal glands, we have the thyroid glands, which is significant, but plays a somewhat complex role when it comes to blood pressure regulation. So with patients who have hyperthyroidism, where there's an excess of T3 and T4 hormones, these hormones act similarly to cortisol. They can increase heart rate, enhance the sensitivity of norepinephrine and epinephrine receptors, which is ultimately going to increase of contractility, as well as vasoconstriction, which is ultimately, again, gonna to lead to a rise in blood pressure. Interesting enough though, when we're looking at hypothyroidism, right? This is going to lead to secondary hypertension as well. What's interesting, is that when we have reduced levels of T3 and T4, this can lead to an increase in sodium retention in the kidneys. So this retention causes that increase in blood volume. Remember, water is going to follow salt, thereby raising blood pressure. While we're not sure the exact mechanism when it comes to T3 and T4, we know that with those low levels, they're also going to be linked to an increase in diastolic blood pressure, possibly due to the changes of how it handles sodium. Lastly, let's consider hyperparathyroidism, which is excessive parathyroid hormone, also known as PTA. So with that excessive production, we're going to see high levels of PTH um, in our bloodstream, which is going to lead to an increase in calcium in our blood. So this increase in calcium concentration is going to affect the smooth muscle cells triggering that vasoconstriction, that tightening of our blood vessels. So this vasoconstriction is gonna increase that total peripheral resistance. Remember, they're not gonna be able to push blood through, which is ultimately going to, again, lead to the rise of high blood pressures. So occasionally individuals experience high intracranial pressure. This is a condition not 
overly um, talked about, but you will eventually see it on your exams as well as in practice, especially if you're going to neuro ICU. So this increase in blood pressure inside the skull can be due to various reasons. It could be brain hemorrhage, it could be a significant cerebral edema, it could be caused by a lot of things. But that high intracranial pressure can lead to what we know as Cushing's triad. This is very important. You're gonna have to know this for nursing school. So first, the patient is going to experience hypertension or high blood pressure, right? That's the beginning of our triad. Secondly, they're going to see a decrease in heart rate that is commonly referred to as bradycardia. And then finally, at the end of this, the patient is going to exhibit irregular and often slowed respirations. So that is what we're looking at when it comes to the Cushing's triad. If the patient presents with high intracranial pressure, such as nausea, vomiting, they can even have like papilla edema, which is a swelling of the opti optical disc, or they could have focal neurological deficits, or even if they have a history of head trauma and intracranial bleeding, it's really important to know this information because the condition could be what's causing that underlying hypertension to take place. So lastly, to finish out this video on hypertension, we're gonna talk about the medication causes, the things that we don't think about a lot when it comes to hypertension. So particularly, we're gonna start with oral contraceptives. It's somewhat surprising, but combined oral contraceptives, which contain estrogen, can play a huge significant role when it comes to hypertension. So estrogen has a unique effect in increasing the liver's production of angiotensinogen. This increase in that angiotensinogen is going to lead to higher productions of angiotensin II, which is a key player for elevating blood pressure through various mechanisms like we talked about before. Another key factor to secondary hypertension involves certain medications and substances like we see in drugs like Adderall and Ritalin, which are prime examples of this. So these medications are commonly used in conditions like ADHD, sometimes even binge eating disorders will see these medications used, but they work together mimicking the sympathetic nervous system. So we talked about that nervous system, right? It's going to ultimately lead to that vasoconstriction, the increased heart rate, because it's going to play with our SA in it a little bit, and it's going to lead to an increase in contractility. So next we have cocaine. So cocaine is a powerful stimulant. It significantly activates our sympathetic nervous system. It sends us into sympathetic over nervous system overdrive. It causes the release of large amounts of that norepinephrine, which is going to lead to the increase in that vasoconstriction, narrowing of our blood pressures, and increase our heart rate. And this leads to a sudden and very dramatic rise in our blood pressure. So it's going to put a very immense strain on our cardiovascular system very quickly and very strongly. So it's important to see and note that the patient, if they are using cocaine, we need to ask them, are you using it? We're not reporting you to anybody. It doesn't matter. We just need to know because we need to figure out what's causing this extreme rise in your blood pressure. Um, ephedrine, usually found in our bronchodilators, nasal congestions, as well as other medications that mimic that uh, sympathetic nervous system as well, is also things that we need to be cognizant of when we're caring for people with hypertension. And then lastly, one thing that you wouldn't think about a whole lot, but actually does come in mind a lot when we're taking care of individuals is licorice. If you're taking licorice in and very high doses, it contains a chemical compound that mimics the hormone aldosterone. So this is ultimately going to lead, like we talked about before, that sodium retention. Water is going to follow salt and that potassium loss. We're going to see dangerously low potassium levels in our cells. It's going to lead to high blood volume, which is ultimately going to lead to high blood pressure. So chronic consumption of licorice or licorice-based products can result in that syndrome known as pseudoaldosteronism, which means that it's characterized by hypertension and electrolyte imbalances because it mimics the aldosterone hormone, but it's not actually being caused by aldosterone. I hope this video was helpful in understanding the diagnostic breakdown as well as pathophysiology of hypertension. As always, if you have any questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechungstore.com. There's a ton of additional resources available to you to help you pass your AP exams as well as your nursing school exams. And as always, I'll catch you in the next video. Bye!